thank you thank you very much so thanks uh, to kenda and oleg uh, for uh, organizing this seminar it's good to be here so uh, today i'm gonna talk to talk about uh, uh, some uh, work on uh, i've been doing for the past uh, more than eight years or so uh, on the evolution of uh, galaxy groups uh, and uh, uh, then i will move on into uh, into clusters so uh, we will, let's start with a brief introduction of course as you all may know uh, galaxy clusters are the most massive uh, bound uh, system objects in the universe that they uh, have a mass from 10 to the 14 till 10 to the 15 solar masses. Uh, they typically contain a few from a few thousand of galaxies out to a radius of to 10 uh, from 2 to 10 megaparsecs, and they are filled in with a 10 to 100 million degree hot gas uh, uh, plasma. Uh, so the we keep in mind that the intra-cluster intra medium is filled with X-ray emission, which is emitted via Bremsstrahlung radiation. Uh, so this, uh, hence, uh, this uh, causes the, an expectation that in the center of uh, galaxy clusters, the gas uh, in the intra-cluster medium uh, will be cooled uh, via X-ray emission. Uh, well, uh, the higher the density, uh, it will lead to a significant loss of energy in a short uh, time. So a steady inflow of gas uh, towards the center of the cluster in the absence of a heating mechanism should be observed. And this is the classical, classical sorry, cooling flow models, but there are some problems. First of all, the high cooling rates that were predicted from ROSAT data in, in the centers of galaxy clusters are not observed. And secondly, the higher resolution uh, XMM uh, Newton RGS spectra, they have not found the expected amounts of cool gas in their cores. So this means that uh, galaxies can influence the gas through non-gravitational processes. So AGN feedback is currently being the current uh, favorite mechanism to explain cooling in, in uh, clusters of galaxies. The AGN uh, presence can heat uh, and blow the gas out of the central regions of the clusters and groups. Uh, then th there have been numerous uh, studies that have contributed to a comprehensive uh, picture uh, that uh, AGN heating is important in galaxy formation and evolution. So uh, what is heating by AGN? Basically, we have the conversion of the radio AGN outflow energy into heating the circumgalactic medium, which is adequate enough to provide the heating needed. So by AGN feedback, we mean the loop process where energy in some kind of form is produced from the central regions of the galaxy and can heat up the inflowing gas preventing it from cooling. And uh, Moving on now to galaxy groups. So they usually contain fewer than 50 group uh, members, but uh, uh, we have seen groups ranging from uh, of members between tens to hundred uh, uh, members. And uh, the group size is relatively smaller than in clusters. It uh, spans from between one and two megaparsecs approximately. And their mass is between 10 to the 13 and 10 to the 14 uh, solar masses. I mean, 10 to the 13 and a half until 10 to the 14 is the gray area between uh, the transition between groups and clusters. Uh, the spread of velocities as well in galaxy groups in the individual galaxies is relatively uh, smaller than in clusters between 150 and 400 kilometers per second. And uh, if we uh, make a comparison between groups and clusters, of course, people often symbolistically consider them as a scaled versions of uh, groups considered being considered as uh, scaled down versions of clusters. However, uh, they have notable differences. For example, uh, galaxy groups, uh, they lack the dominance of the intra-group medium over the galactic component, uh, which means that we have uh, the intra-cluster medium uh, dominating the baryon content in, in comparison to the member galaxies. Whereas on the other hand, in uh, galaxy groups, uh, this might be even, or even the baryon uh, budget in uh, galaxy members can be higher than in the gas itself. Uh, in addition, groups uh, have a smaller baryon fraction than in clusters. And the main cooling mechanism in galaxy groups is line emission, whereas in clusters it is thermal Bremsstrahlung, as we just mentioned. So why should we then care about groups of galaxies? Well, uh, more than half of uh, the galaxies in the local universe resides in groups, and most of the evolution of the galaxies uh, takes place in the group environment. All galaxies uh, are into uh, close uh, proximity at low relative velocities, which promotes tidal interactions and mergers. Uh, some of them, of course, also uh, uh, possess extensive halos of cold gas. They have uh, short uh, central cooling times, and they can fuel star formation and active galactic nuclei. 
Uh, in addition, they have shallower gravitational potential, thus the agent heating and galactic winds can in principle have stronger imprints in the galaxy group environment. Therefore, the agent feedback in groups has the greatest impact on galaxy evolution and uh, uh, formation. However, there is a problem. Uh, there is a lack of a statistically complete radio and X-ray nearby group sample. And uh, in order to deal with this, we have uh, started on uh, embarked with a CLOGS project, which is, which is an optically selected statistically complete sample of 53 nearby groups uh, in less than 80 megaparsecs. And the CLOGS project uh, aims to be the first statistically volume limited complete sample of uh, galaxy groups observed in the X-ray, optical, and uh, uh, radio uh, wavelengths. The radio study of the sample was performed uh, in 2018-19 by myself using the GMRT 235 and 610 megahertz data. And so far, uh, we have expanded uh, studies uh, with my colleagues, uh, Osali Vanetal, into CO, uh, cold molecular gas, and uh, news data optical from Olivares, uh, stellar kinematics by Lobs et al. earlier this year, news ionization mechanism by Lagos et al., and of course, the use of uh, uh, star formation indicators, which I will talk shortly about it. Uh, in brief, uh, what are some of the projects that this, uh, some, sorry, some of the goals that this project has is like, what are the fraction of optically selected groups that contain a hot intergroup medium? What fraction of them have uh, cool cores? Uh, we know that 50% of clusters uh, are cool core systems, but the archival samples of groups have up to 85% cool core systems. Uh, we want to check whether a group a central agent can balance uh, uh, cooling from uh, X-ray emission, how are central agents affected by environment, and on and on. And, uh, and how do we do that? The best way is to do it by combining radio plus X-rays, where we will have uh, a pro uh, insight into the processes involved from uh, the X-rays. Uh, the X-ray structures will provide us the location of, and the properties of most baryons and estimation of energy in cavity shocks, et cetera. And on the other hand, the radio jets will provide us the time scales via synchrotron aging, constraints on source geometry, and direct view of aging gas interactions. And uh, here you can see uh, what is the uh, filamentary structure of the local universe. And in the red, you can see the location of the brightest group early type galaxy of, uh, of uh, each uh, uh, group. And in blue, you can see the, the extent of each members. Uh, in brief, uh, CLOGS uh, was selected in a way starting by the Lion Galaxy group from Garcia. With, we started off with 485 uh, groups and then by uh, performing a selection by selecting more than four members for each uh, group, uh, at least one early type member being there with spe specific luminosity and a declination of above uh, minus 30 to ensure visibility from GMRT and VLA, we ended up with 67 groups. Then we further expand and refine the membership by updating the membership from Hyperlida. And also by using ISO density maps, we uh, were able to reject problematic cases. Uh, this was also been uh, helped by uh, having a filter on richness, by we, which we defined as the number of galaxies having a specific luminosity uh, above uh, 1.6, 10 to the minus 10. This helps us in excluding uh, non-clusters, so uh, systems that had uh, richness uh, above 10, they were non-clusters. And on the other hand, we excluded groups that were too poor or too small to characterize, that were having a, a richness be, uh, equal to one and uh, actually or below, because uh, we not all groups, for example, have uh, a central uh, uh, galaxy, uh, an early type central galaxy, or an, and some of them are spiral dominated. So by that, we ensure that we have the best comparison to, to clusters. So in ensuring that there, there will be X-ray emission there. So we ended up with two uh, richness um, samples, the high richness one between four and eight, and the low richness one between two and three. Uh, this is a, a mosaic of, uh, the result, of all of the results of the systems in clocks that we, I will shortly focus on some interesting cases uh, here in the stock. Uh, we can see the overlay of, in the, of the X-ray emission in uh, uh, blue and green, and on top we can see uh, the overlay of uh, radio. So as I uh, just mentioned earlier, this was uh, performed by the GMRT data, and uh, initially I had performed that uh, how we call it by hand, but uh, after that, the, the spam pipeline came and uh, I, I was able to process this data a lot quicker. So uh, the radio images that will be shown, they have a typical RMS between 50 and 100 microjanskis at 6, 10 megahertz. At 235, uh, it is between 300 and 500 microjanskis. 
And the X-ray data analysis was performed by Dr. Ewan O'Sullivan by CFA using observations from Chandra and XMM telescopes. So to get started with some uh, results from the radio side, uh, we find that 87% uh, uh, of the central brightest group early type galaxies are detected at any radio frequency, either GMRT 235 or 610 or NVSS first. And all of these detected radio sources, they differ dramatically in size, in radio power, and morphology. Uh, around half of them uh, are actually boring. They are point-like uh, radio sources. And the interested one, interesting ones are like 90% that have jets, and with the non-detections being at 13%. The typical radio powers that we see span uh, from uh, 235 megahertz between 10 to the 21 and 10 to the 25 uh, watts per hertz, and their projected sizes uh, are as small as uh, three kiloparsecs, and they get as big as two megaparsecs. So closely to what we actually observe in some uh, systems, in some jet systems in clusters, in some of the extreme cases. Uh, I will uh, uh, move on further, saying that uh, all this trend from earlier studies that uh, have been uh, used on X-ray selected or other samples of bright uh, ellipticals in clusters, uh, I agree with our own in suggesting that with suffi sufficiently deep observations. Uh, almost all group or cluster dominant galaxies will be found to host a central radio source. So we confirmed a trend of high radio detection rate of central BGEs in the local universe. Uh, going on now into the results from the X-rays, uh, we have categorized the groups in two classes according to their X-ray properties. Uh, in class one, as you can see over here, it includes groups uh, that have X-ray emission detected uh, more than 65 kiloparsecs uh, from their core. So we call them actually bright. So they look something like that here to the left. And in class two, we include the remaining of galaxies that present galaxy scale or point X-ray emission, which is, uh, and we call them as X-ray faint, uh, which is, has a detection of in low, less than 65 kiloparsecs. We find that uh, almost half of the uh, groups have a full scale intragroup medium. And uh, of these uh, 26 X-ray confirmed groups, again, 14 of those, they were either unknown or misidentified as single galaxies prior to our observations. Uh, so 12 of them were only identified by the Rosal Polsky uh, survey. So we expect that around 30% of the X-ray bright groups in the local volume might still be unknown. Uh, around 42% or 40% of the X-ray bright groups host radio jet systems, which implies an AGN duty cycle for clock groups of over one third. All of the five jet systems that are in X-ray bright groups are found in systems that possess cool core. So I will get into that in a minute. And all, all radio non-detections are found in X-ray faint groups. So we're starting seeing a pattern here. So uh, we have seen that the jet systems, uh, while being in X-ray bright environments and while injecting energy in the intragroup medium, they have not dramatically increased the entropy of their immediate surroundings, except from one system, NGC 193, which I will talk shortly in detail. So the jet activity is actually in groups correlated to short central cooling times rather than low central entropies. And all jet sources in X-ray bright groups, they have short central cooling, time, cooling times, less than 7.7 .7 giga years. But by definition, all groups uh, are cool cores by cluster definition. And I'll move on and talking about some of the individual and interesting systems that we have worked on all these uh, throughout the, these uh, years, uh, like the case of NGC 5903, where uh, we know that this possessed uh, 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 from Apple to the 1990 uh, in white, we can see on the right, uh, it has a 110 kiloparsec long H1 filament. And we find that in, in radio, in the middle image, we can see in CN the radio emission at 235 megahertz, it's, that spans at 75 kiloparsec. Uh, so this is, was a steep uh, spectrum source of unknown origin. And by uh, examining the origin of the correlated X-ray, H1, and uh, radio structures, we find that it uh, has been triggered via an interaction agent outburst with a specific jet power, plus via a high velocity collision between a galaxy and the filament. So we can see that the uh, disruption in the X-ray image in the middle uh, in uh, it is it kind of have, has an arc shift and we have found that there has been also a collision between uh, galaxy and, uh, uh, that was passing by moving on moving sorry moving on into uh, the next system uh, ngc 4261 a big uh, jet uh, system uh, that uh, spans of around 80 uh, kiloparsecs 
We have uh, used the spectral aging models, the signage package by Borgia uh, 2003, and we estimated the radiative age of jets being between 29 to 37 million years. So uh, we suggest that uh, either an early supersonic phase of Mach 6 has uh, been the case, or the source has underwent uh, via multiple aging outbursts with large changes in jet power. Uh, we have uh, done that by performing a point-to-point -point spectral index analysis, as you can see over here. And th yes, these are the plots where we can actually uh, have the model running to find the break frequency and calculate the radiative age that, that I just mentioned. So in addition, we have also uh, checked uh, in the lobe, in the, above the jet, the lobe area, and we have calculated the phi factor, the filling factor, and we have found significant gas entrainment from the tip of the jets to the back of the lobe. So this is again one example what is the level of detail we can go into even for jet systems the next one the most recent one uh, the most recent work was uh, the ngc 1550 which actually shows uh, a indication of sloshing from the observed as you can see on the top left arc shaped structure in the x-ray residual map uh, this is actually by uh, studying the simulations uh, the, by performing x-ray simulations we find that uh, there is a similar uh, pattern that arises from a perturber of uh, five masses uh, that, ex that is five masses five times more sorry than the host galaxy that actually uh, comes by and uh, crosses by and creates a sloshing into the system over there so we find that the radiative age uh, is in agreement with the x-ray dynamical uh, scale of from 35 to 40 million years and the shortest time scale estimation for the sloshing motions is between 40 to 80 million years so we actually uh, suggest that the observed uh, radio and X-ray structure is a combination of sloshing motions with the effects of forces from the jet lobe growth in the ICM. As you can see in the bottom picture in the CN, as you can see the emission uh, at uh, 610 megahertz of uh, um, the, sorry, the radio emission at 610 megahertz, and you can see that there is a kink at the, uh, below the core of the jet. And uh, also, there is the, the jet is asymmetric, where the uh, eastern part, the eastern lobe, is actually suppressed in the, it's, and it's not able to expand further on. So, although uh, this system was uh, considered as a, as a relaxed hosting a decaying radio source, we find evidence that, evidence that it has undergone through a recent minor merger. And uh, this has drawn uh, the attention of the Oxford University uh, Press blog and. Uh, there is a, 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 an article where explaining how old galaxy groups stay active in retirement. So you can have a look if you're interested into that system for further details. Um, so now, uh, moving on into the energetics, what can we see then? What can we get from the sample about AGN feedback? We can calculate the AGN feedback by the work that is done from the jet, jets in the lobes in moving a volume of gas V and the pressure P in the surrounding environment. So uh, here you can see the X-ray image uh, of, a, of a system. And here you can see of NGC 4261, sorry, in, in uh, radio in CN, overlaid on the X-ray image uh, uh, of the system. So for the BGEs that host uh, jet sources, we estimate the mechanical power output of the jets using the approach similar to Sullivan in 2011. And only for one system where we are not able to uh, detect the uh, cavity sizes, NGC 1060, we just assume them to be based on the extent of the uh, 610 uh, emission. So we find that uh, in comparison to the um, uh, cluster uh, systems, we find that the groups, of course, fall uh, much lower uh, than the uh, typical cluster samples. Uh, the mechanical power ranges between 10 to the 41 and 10 to the 43. And uh, of course, the system that we just assumed the cavities falls much lower uh, over here in the uh, uh, graph, in the plot. So here we have only just uh, seen uh, what is the expected uh, uh, cavity power and the radio power. But what is more important is uh, the energetics and the comparison between uh, the heating of, that the AGN produces and the cooling from the X-ray emission. Uh, so we are able to do that by knowing the cooling luminosity from the X-ray emission from the gas that is, uh, exists in each group and the cavity power that we get uh, based on the gas that has been moved from the AGN jet. And we find that uh, the small scale jets and the remnant jets lie within the scatter that indicates approximately thermal balance. Uh, on the other hand, these two big jet systems, NGC 193 and 4261, they are significantly overpowered exceeding over 100 times their environment's cooling luminosity. 
So this actually, these guys are actually overcooking their uh, system. So AGN in, uh, feedback in galaxy groups can manifest as a relatively gentle near continuous thermal regulation, which, uh, but also as extreme outbursts, which uh, could potentially shut down cooling for longer periods of time. And going into more detail about these two systems, uh, on the left, you can see NGC 193 overlaid with uh, X-ray image, as we can see a huge cavity has been in, in inflated. Uh, but in both of these systems, although they look similar in, in the radio, uh, heat, cooling and heating uh, has become detached with the jets actually heating the intra-group medium, but not the material which is fueling the AGN. For example, in NGC 193, uh, we know that the single huge cavity has been uh, uh, inflated, and the, this drives uh, most of the gas, hot gas away from the galaxy. The entropy in the center uh, is actually enhanced because most of the gas has been driven out of the core, so we have lower density in there. And actually, the system is, is fueled by what is uh, left uh, in the center, well, how much gas left is over there, and it would shortly, shortly cease. On the other hand, NGC 4261, that we can see a zoomed version image over here, uh, the jets we know that have cut channels through the cool core and only expand into lobes way outside of it. So the jets actually are hitting a region which is outside of the core. So until the core is heated, no matter what we do, the jet will not stop. So we still observe uh, a low uh, entropy in the core and which is actually largely unaffected by the jets. And uh, now moving on into uh, other uh, uh, wavelengths, uh, checking now also we were able to check the cold gas, uh, the molecular CO gas in clogs BGs. Uh, we, had, we just keep that the, the detection CO rate is uh, 40%. More than 50% of the CO detected systems uh, present H1 emission. And that uh, the CO detection is found in both X-ray bright and X-ray faint groups, which actually implies that the, or, the both cooling and merging uh, origin of the gas. So the, the brightest group early type galaxies that we have examined, uh, they present the low uh, star formation rates, less than one million years, uh, sorry, one sorry, solar mass uh, per year, and short depletion time, less than 10 to the eight uh, years. So uh, the large uh, CO mass, actually, that we observe isn't required to trigger an AGN outburst. But what plays more role, we will see in a bit. Uh, I have also examined uh, earlier this year uh, uh, different uh, star formation indicators uh, for uh, these systems, uh, like the FUV minus kappa, kappa S, uh, where we actually find that only 13% uh, of the BG show signs of active star formation. The rest, as expected, are like passive and faint. And all of these uh, active star forming systems that are FUV bright are lenticular systems. They are cold gas rich and they host only weak radio sources. Uh, and in addition, they occupy X ray faint group. So again, we start seeing a pattern over here. We have also examined the uh, wise diagnostic uh, from the mid for the mean different sorry activity of this uh, system from Jared et al. 2017 and 2019. And uh, we find that 87% of the brightest group uh, LA type galaxies lie in the spheroid uh, region over here. Only one system falls in the active star forming disks. And five system actually we are caught as mid infrared intermediate disks, uh, which are actually three out of the five earlier clusters active star forming. And uh, so what does this tell us? That start, so uh, the, the point there, that it's not like having cold gas, it's about the dynamical state of the gas. So we also went on and checked what is the morphology of the CO gas. So we have uh, clouds and disks, and we find that four out of six active star forming systems, they show signs of hosting rotating gas disks, and only one out of two of the mid infrared intermediate disk systems does that. So we uh, suggest that, uh, of course, the numbers are low, but it's only a suggestion that star formation is uh, not driven merely by the presence of cold gas, but by its dynamical state. So the disks provide a stable environment in which the gas has time to collapse and form stars. And since all of these active star forming systems occupy X-ray faint system, system, sorry, the cold gas is unlikely to be the product of cooling from a hot intra-group medium, but it's more likely to be acquired through, through gas-rich mergers or tidal interactions. And uh, by checking as well the specific star formation rate and the cold gas in the clogged BGs, uh, we find that most radio powerful BGs occupy X-ray bright groups. This demonstrates the linkage between intra-group medium cooling and jet no mode feedback. And we find no evidence 
that the presence of radio jets is affecting the star formation in BGEs, even most the most powerful and long lived ones. Uh, also, new studies have been performed uh, in a, a small sample of the uh, uh, clogged BGEs, and there were optical emitting gas shows filamentary structure in most in 18 that have been uh, observed in 10 out of 18 of the radio sources with a variety of shapes, project sizes spanning from 3 to 12 uh, kiloparsecs, similar to central cluster galaxies. Uh, H-alpha luminosity is found to correlate uh, strongly with a cold molecular gas. And uh, the T cool T80 radius and central entropy values of the X-ray atmosphere, at least for at least 11 out of 18 of those, they're possibly cooling gas from their hot atmospheres via thermal instabilities. So this all of them correspond to filaments, uh, compact disk dominated sources, and uh, only one of them presents extending rotating disks, NGC 1453. So uh, this larger fraction of uh, rotating disks in brightest uh, group early type galaxies than in clusters may hint towards a non-negligible uh, contribution of mergers or gas strips from cosmological satellites. So it is more to happen in, uh, prone to happen in low mass uh, halos and uh, with extended gas disks are found in systems where the intra-group medium is not uh, actually uh, X-ray detected. So uh, as well from the new side, we have uh, some uh, confirmation of the merger origin of the gas. And uh, and uh, going into now uh, more detail from uh, another paper from uh, Patricio Lagos et al, uh, uh, that has examined the news optical data and uh, uh, that uh, has used also GMRT uh, 235 16 MHz for fitting block systems that examines in detail and interprets the properties of ionized gas around BGE score. And uh, one of the systems that I'm uh, actually now uh, speeding up to follow up is ISO 507 where uh, uh, a couple of years ago, Mirkat Open Time has been uh, uh, awarded and uh, for 10 of clocks uh, targets uh, for continuum observation plan plus H1 in order to study in more detail the connection between the radio emission in the local universe and the cold ionized gas. So uh, the Mirkat data analysis is actually uh, underway using Caracal and the idea ILIFO facilities. And uh, here in the middle, uh, long story short, you can see the H alpha uh, uh, image in, in yellow, which is uh, superposed by uh, the 235 megahertz uh, uh, radio emission from the, the GMRT. Uh, on the left, you can see now that this is a, a very a new result, the, the radio emission at 1.28 gigahertz from uh, Mirkat data with an RMS of 10 microjanskis. And we see that Mirkat is able to detect in fine detail, I mean, the whole uh, gas, the whole ring of H alpha around. So this is still a work in process. So we are uh, we will be able to check in more detail the H1, H1 and the, um, the, the cold gas properties and the ionized gas properties in those systems that uh, actually show uh, star formation. Uh, of course, another study has been performed by uh, Ilani Lobser uh, earlier again this year with new spectroscopy this time, uh, where uh, that analyzed BGEs. Uh, it has been found again that uh, seven out of 10 are fast rotators that contain cold gas, whereas four out of eight uh, are slow rotators, which also contain cold gas. So co the cold gas presence in both classes again suggests different cold gas origins. Uh, I uh, deposited during gas rich mergers or tidal interaction. So, similar uh, uh, patterns arise uh, again by studying stellar kinematics. Uh, so, we find observational evidence for the slow rotators that are consistent with gas poor mergers. And for the slow rotator, rotator sorry, with cold gas, all evidence points to cold gas cooling from the hydro group medium. So, uh, this is, let's say, the, the first, the end of the uh, first part uh, talking about groups. So a few take home points that extreme outbursts are also occurring in the group environment rather than only a low uh, power uh, weak uh, AGN. The clock sample BGEs, uh, they constitute a mosaic of systems that uh, the, their evolution is affected by a combination of secular processes and mergers interactions regulated by the environment in which they reside. And uh, in addition, we keep in mind that the presence of a large cold gas reservoir in the form of a rotating disk seems to promote active star formation and to originate from gas rich mergers and interactions. Whereas, on the other hand, the presence of an X ray bright intragroup medium increases the chances of aging jet activity, with the origin of the cold gas in this case is cooling from the intragroup medium. 
So uh, I will move on into the second part of the talk, which is uh, talking about clusters and uh, the results that we get uh, with Mirkat, which is what we actually uh, have been doing for the past couple of years. And uh, yes, a few words about Mirkat for uh, people that might not also be aware of that. So uh, Mirkat, as you know, is an SDA precursor. It consists of uh, 64 dishes, uh, which each one uh, being of 13.5 uh, diameter. It observes the sky uh, below a declination of uh, plus uh, 15 de degrees and is operational in L, S, and UHF bands. Uh, the Mirkat's L band, uh, which is primary full, full width at half maximum, is at uh, 1.2 degrees at 1.28 gigahertz, was the first to be commissioned in 2018. Uh, the minimum baseline of Mirkat is uh, very uh, short, short is uh, 29 meters, and the maximum baseline spans an, up until 8 kilometers. Uh, it consists of two uh, parts. The first one is the dense inner component uh, that contains uh, about 70% of the dishes, and uh, there is another uh, outer component that contains 30% uh, of the dishes. Uh, with up to 2016 baselines and four uh, polarization products per baseline, the Mirka data volumes are not insignificant. Uh, the recorded, uh, for example, data rates for a 4K channel mode and eight uh, second integration period is around 0.14 terabyte per hour, which can reach up to 1.1 terabyte per hour for a 32K channel mode. And uh, so, uh, all, in addition, RFI is also a challenge uh, having such a wide band, but it's actually uh, very well uh, now uh, being uh, dealt. I'm just mentioning that, that in the era of the very big bandwidth, we have all sorts of uh, emission that actually interferes with our uh, bandwidth. So, uh, uh, what uh, we have been working now the, the past uh, couple of years is like the Mirkat Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey. It consists of 115 targets observed between June 2018 and June 2019. Uh, there have been around 1,000 hours of observations with uh, around 60 dishes uh, in the L-band at full polarization mode from 900 to 1,670 1, megahertz. And uh, there was uh, about 8 to 12 hours uh, observations uh, per cluster with around 5.5 to 9 hours on source. Uh, we mentioned that uh, uh, MGCLS, that it, it's actually the survey paper uh, published earlier this year by Noel et al. Uh, uh, it is a heterogeneous sample that has uh, specifically no mass or ratchet selection criteria that consists of two groups. One is the radio selected one, which are uh, 41 groups from earlier known diffuse radio emission studies. And two, the an X-ray selected one, uh, that have been selected from the MCXC catalog uh, from PFAR et al. 2011. The declination of the X-ray selected sample spans from minus 80 to plus 15. A median rate shift is around 0.14 uh, uh, Z, and only four clusters are found at a rate shift more than 0.4. So uh, with the survey paper, uh, it's now open to public in the community with raw visibilities. And uh, it contains of image products uh, that uh, have from three to five microjanskis per beam uh, RMS. Uh, the, we have the basic image products that are the 16 plane cube uh, uh, that con consists of total intensity, the spectral index, and 14 frequencies. The enhanced image products uh, that uh, are uh, divided into two uh, sets uh, the one which is the normal resolution at seven arc second. The second one, which is the lower one at 15 arc second. All of them uh, have a primary beam corrected to total density and spectral index cube five plane uh, uh, cubes and uh, PB corrected uh, frequency cubes of 12 uh, planes. So uh, the MGCLS data sets, they have uh, a broad range of applications uh, like uh, diffuse radio emission, which I'm, I'm going to shortly talk about and focus over here. Uh, in band spectral indices, polarization, H1 sign, star formation, source catalogs, radio AGN. You name it. Uh, so uh, I'll just show a few uh, pretty images, some of the first uh, results that we have. Uh, we see uh, quite a diversity in the detec detection of uh, AGN. Uh, we have uh, band sources, uh, 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 wide angle delta sources. And on the right hand, you can see uh, uh, the emission from uh, 3C40 at 1.28 gigahertz. So what we are actually being able to see with Mirkat's uh, 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 sensitivity uh, and the resolution. Uh, newly filamentary, as you can see over here, living on towards to the east uh, on this source, filamentary structures 
that uh, enable 194, for example, that cannot be explained with any current radio galaxy models. Uh, as such, very large scale uh, features are not seen in numerical uh, simulations of radio galaxies, not where earlier predicted. So we're starting seeing uh, more or less a new uh, uh, kind of structures. And I'm, I'm just gonna focus here, for example, in the case of a mysterious radio galaxy tail uh, in uh, Abel 3266. On the left, you can see in green, the relative location uh, of this uh, radio, uh, radio uh, tail uh, in comparison to the core of the cluster. Uh, and on the right, uh, you can see the radio emission uh, overlaid on the optical uh, uh, emission. And what we are able to see is that uh, there are um, there is a quasi periodic uh, brightnesses and patches of brightnesses that uh, continue up to some uh, the existence of tethers and filamentary structures or till the end of this source. So um, this actually looks like uh, these observations of Omega from this mysterious tail source. It looks like very closely. Uh, you can check the right bottom uh, screen uh, the image. Oh, that was produced uh, using low far observations of IC uh, 711 uh, from Van Veren et al. in 2021. So on similar scale. So we're actually seeing the emergence of unusual features that are uh, associated with tailed radio galaxies. And uh, perhaps uh, we, we, are, we, are, we don't know exactly the origin of, of this radio source. So to be honest, we, we see on the right over here uh, an optical counterpart, but we still cannot be sure of its origin. But these tethers and uh, perhaps the ribs that are being seen belong to the newly emerging examples of thin magnetized threads that are linking larger regions of relativistic plasma that has also earlier seen in Ramachoko until 2020. Uh, so uh, one of the key aspects actually, uh, a key aspect actually of the radio observations of galaxy clusters is the detection of diffuse cluster scale synchrotron emission. Uh, this carries information about the cluster formation history, and there are several different classifications of diffuse cluster radio emission historically separated into three main classes, radio halos, mini halos, and radio relics. All of these classes are characterized by low surface brightness and steep spectra. And now I'll show you uh, some examples of what we actually observe with uh, MGCLS uh, survey papers. So, we are actually uh, we are able to to detect uh, new structures, new uh, uh, emission with a finer detail. On the right hand, hand sorry, on the right hand, you can see uh, in blue uh, the radio emission at uh, 1.28 gigahertz, and uh, overlaid on the optical image. And in white, you can see the X-ray uh, superposition of the X-ray emission. Uh, we are able to find new details for known sources, like for example, detect in more detail uh, relics mini halos that were just candidates or were uh, not known before, uh, as well as uh, tailed galaxies. Um, in addition, we have the discovery of uh, the faintest relic uh, to date, uh, with uh, total flux density at 1.28 gigahertz being around uh, 3 uh, millijanski, which corresponds uh, to a radio power of around 1.7, 10 to the 22. So Mirkat is actually pushing uh, to the limits, so, to, so we are able to observe uh, with greater sensitivity uh, new structures in more detail, known structures to add up to our knowledge. Uh, just an example to, to show you how uh, clean uh, the field of uh, uh, Mirkat data looks. The J27.3 field, which shows the Mirkat's instantaneous sensitivity to a range, to a, sorry, to a range of angular scales. On the left, they convolve 25 arc second one, and on the right, the normal full resolution at seven arc seconds. Uh, what I'm actually uh, working for the, the past year or so, following up the survey paper, is uh, creating the uh, cluster diffuse radio emission catalog. So uh, this means that uh, moving on and uh, being able to uh, calculate for all of the 115 clusters specific uh, properties, radio properties uh, for each structure that has been observed. Uh, before we get to that, uh, some statistics from the, that we get from the MGCLS uh, uh, survey, we find that around 54% of the clusters present some kind of diffuse emission, uh, with some of them actually hosting more than one, any type diffuse cluster radio source. Uh, in total, we find 104 distinct uh, detections, of which 61 are uh, noted as new. Uh, quite a few mini halos, uh, more uh, relics and radio halos, one radio phoenix and, and two candidates, 
And uh, we have now, we are able now to characterize, uh, we, have, we have left uncharacterized one uh, source. Uh, so, um, uh, by in, in this way, we are, we are able now to uh, uh, see, oh, sorry, uh, here we, we see the actual location of these uh, 115 clusters in the, uh, sky, uh, the, the sky position. And in um, Cyan, uh, Rhombus, you, were, you, uh, you are able to see the clusters that hold diffuse emission. Open Rhombus, the clusters that are without diffuse emission. And in uh, red uh, square, you can uh, actually see the ones that are X-ray selected. So uh, as mentioned earlier, a complete analysis uh, of uh, all of these diffuse uh, cluster sources in these 62 clusters that have uh, diffuse emission is underway, which includes, uh, includes flux densities, spectral indices, sizes, RMS at low resolution, radio power measurements, and of course the presentation of the radium images. And uh, adding uh, more to the picture of that, we are able to, to, to check the scaling relation between the cluster mass and the radio power for the MGCLS systems uh, that host uh, radio halos and uh, uh, mini halos, also included the candidate system over here by using uh, the scaled M500 uh, uh, masses from uh, Hilton et al. 20, 2021. So uh, as observed earlier before, for example, from the headex lofar study from Van Veren et al. 2021, of course, for uh, the scale to a different uh, frequency uh, of uh, 150 megahertz, we are actually this is preliminary results. Uh, we are able also to see a clear correlation uh, that has been observed between M500 and uh, the radio power. Uh, what is also uh, included in this uh, follow-up uh, catalog paper is that uh, we provide the more details in the highlight uh, of for five highlighted uh, system. Uh, over here, for example, you can see uh, in red the XMM Newton uh, images, the radio contours of the 15 arc second uh, in white uh, that are overlaid in the either the RG uh, optical image of pan stars to the left or the ZI uh, dark energy survey optical image on the right. So by going into more detail into the systems, we will be able to examine uh, the, the new detections that we have the, and uh, be able to provide a bit more information on some of these specific systems. I will just move on and then show you that the product images will uh, uh, look something like that. They will be in the appendix of the diffuse catalog paper, hopefully some bit early next year, but I don't wanna say a specific date. And, but uh, what we keep in mind is that the MTCLS galaxy clusters, they just provide a glimpse only of the many diffuse cluster emissions that, and discoveries that are likely to be made in the SK era. And uh, it, of course, it, it has uh, several cases where we have, uh, uh, of course, difficulties in obtaining the flux density, like when you have a head tail, uh, like on the left uh, uh, source embedded in, your, in the center. If you have uh, lots of point sources where the mini halos and the halos extraction makes it more challenging. But uh, this is something that uh, we are uh, able to deal and uh, get as many as we can from the uh, emission. So uh, what I should say that uh, there is more to come. There is lots of work, of course, to be done with the legacy products. Uh, like, for example, uh, the study of aging feedback using the GMRT Hello Survey clusters included in MGCLS. Uh, earlier, again, uh, this year we uh, performed, uh, uh, sorry, there is a project of uh, studying a faint uh, newly found mini Hellos. For two of them, earlier this year, uh, we have been accepted Chandra time and uh, they are actually going to be observed, I think, uh, again at some point uh, next year. And there is also collaboration between NYU, uh, Rhodes University, Kenda with IRAF, uh, in enough with uh, Tiziana Venturi, that we are able to use the MGCLS products for co-supervision of honors projects and students at NYU. And I will be submitting two this year. Uh, for clock, on the clock side, uh, there is the Mercat Open Time that has been awarded uh, for the 10 clock systems will enable us to study in more detail the connection between the radio emission and the, in the local universe and also in the cold ionized gas. And I will just uh, summarize uh, with a part two, uh, some take uh, away points. First of all, that the MGCLS datasets have a broad range of applications with unprecedented sensitivity on wide range of scales. The MGCLS galaxy clusters provide only a glimpse of the many diffuse cluster emissions that discoveries that are likely to be made in the SK era. 
So that we find structures in several clusters that do not fall into typical classes, revealing the need for new dynamical or particle field amplification processes in the ICM. We have the detection already of the lowest luminosity relic candidate to date due to the excellent surface brightness sensitivity of MGCLS. And uh, uh, like I've mentioned, the big uh, cluster catalog survey is going to be followed up, is going to follow up the survey paper from Knowles et al. 2022, which is hopefully going to be submitted early next year. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much. I saw I saw in chat that we already had some questions. I think Tim had the first question from remote. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim yeah. do you want to? Uh, thanks, Oleg, and thanks for the talk. That was uh, really really interesting. Um, I guess I had a, a question regarding the isodensity maps. You were were rejecting problematic cases. Yes, what, for the groups. Yes. What what was the situation? I mean, what were you projecting using those maps? Yes. Uh, so for this, uh, this comes from the GLOG sample for the so it goes for the groups uh, survey. So in yep. in that case, uh, there were uh, uh, many systems, for example, that were uh, like uh, were not having uh, they were having chance associations of members. That's why we had the, to to include the richness criteria. Where we were able to, to to detect which one of those uh, were having this kind of properties, so that we are able, first of all, to exclude those that are known clusters. That if they have a richness more uh, than ten, which means that they have ten galaxies, sorry, yes, ten galaxies above a specific uh, uh, luminosity, it means they are clusters. And on the other hand, uh, the ones that have uh, that had had richness uh, equals to one, they are really too poor to constraint or to do any physics with them. So I don't know if that answers the question. This goes back to the clock selection. And in addition, like I mentioned, it's, it's, of course, it's a huge problem. Um, there are many systems that they, they do not, for example, in groups, not all of them have a central uh, brightest group LA type galaxy. Some of them were uh, just parallel dominated or they don't even uh, have a central uh, BGE. So we, we, we didn't want that because we wanted them to be uh, as, uh, let's say, close as possible to, to the cluster equivalent so that we can confirm that they are fully X-ray collapsed and that they are genuinely groups, so. Oh, well, look, thank you very much. That's very helpful. And so uh, uh, just a follow-up question. Were, were all yes. of the groups X-ray detected and then only a fraction of them were radio detected? Was that the case, that they all had to be visible in the X-ray in order to be selected? Uh, uh, ah, I see what you mean. Uh, no, we did. It was optically selected, and then we went back and we confirmed from the uh, an X-ray selection. So the selection <clears throat> was done from the LGG catalog. So it was an optical selection, but we followed up with X-rays in order. So it, yes, it was not a prerequisite. The properties uh, were a prerequisite. So to have a central BG, have at least four members. So we, in a way, we uh, selected those that were most likely to have X-ray emission detected. So it, it was not pre-X-ray selected, if that is your question, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks, that's very helpful. Yeah. Cool, there's there's more questions on okay. the screen, actually, you can see directly, you can probably ignore mine, it's not, yeah. not important, but there's from Konstantinos and from Lexi. Lexi, yes, so. If you can read it all. Yes, uh, are, yes. are there plans of performing polarimetric analysis on the filaments? Ah, yeah, good question. Um, not yet, uh, but um, uh, I, I suppose we're talking about, yes, the MGCLS products. And uh, there is um, actually um, a consensus going on. So we, we will try to, uh, people are trying to get uh, polarization, sorry, uh, uh, data out to be done. But no, to be honest, uh, on, on my part, on my hand, no, there is not. Uh, uh, at least on my on my work, there is not such a uh, um, intention to 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 check the polarimetry on these uh, filaments. Ah, sorry. Yes, can you estimate group masses? Uh, okay. Um, yes, thank you for the, your question, uh, Constantinos Tassis. Uh, so uh, we are actually. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, getting the masses from uh, using the, uh, from the Planck uh, clusters, from the Planck, Planck data, or uh, from the ACT uh, paper that I mentioned, the Hilton et al. So uh, we are not actually uh, estimating ourselves uh, the masses, but the problem here is that uh, we should be able to know and select which masses to 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 choose the SZ ones probably uh, because there is some discrepancy between the Planck masses and the ACT masses. So uh, what I showed earlier for the comparison between the radio power and the uh, cluster masses, only I selected only the ACT cluster so that we have one specific. Uh, mass uh, cluster mass origin. So we are uh, no, we are not actually estimating masses, but uh, we are able to use different tools to to get. To that. Hope that answers. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, people can also raise their hands if they want to ask a question. But otherwise, we're at the end of the hour, so we can. <laughs> I forgot about this. All, all technology. Yes. <laughs> there's actually there's people in the room. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> okay. Um, um, yeah, so thanks for the very nice talks. A lot of cool stuff to digest. I actually have a question about the first first part as well. I'm sorry if my understanding is a bit slow, but you mentioned that um, because you detect molecular gas in like all kinds of systems, there's evidence for um the acquisition of gas in like the various different ways. Why exactly is that the case? How does it work? Can you tell that? Yeah, okay. uh, I remember that you should go to that. Can you maybe repeat the question? Yes. So the question was, as I understand, uh, why do we have uh, the mole? So we have detection in groups. Uh, we have the molecular gas uh, that has been detected, and uh, so therefore, why do we know that the origin comes from star formation, or what do we know about the different origin of the CO mass? Correct. Uh, I mean, I, I can reply by by heart because first of all, the statistics is very low. Uh, I, I should say that, but at least we we have the indication that. Uh, um, so, for example, for those that have, we have 40% of them that have been detected in CO. Uh, some of them appear in X-ray bright groups, which means that there is a hot gas around it. And some of them in X-ray thin group, which means that there is not a, a hot gas in intra group medium over there. So the idea is that if you have some kind of uh, molecular gas appeared in the X-ray bright systems, uh, most likely it looks like this is coming from the cooling of the uh, intra group medium. And there are models that support that from Gaspari et al. I don't remember exactly, but there are simulations which actually show this. The problem is when you see cold gas in, into the X ray faint groups, or okay, at least now, yes, with Erosita and with the next, maybe this, we will see some more detection. We will believe that uh, as X ray faint, maybe we will get to see something more now, eh? some more gas detected over there. So that there is actually gas there rather than being uh, not so much gas to be heated due to the low gravitational potential over there. So in that case, though, you don't have enough gas that can cool to, to create this uh, existing uh, CO mass over there. And this is where the most uh, uh, pro profound reason that you might have. This is from tidal interaction, uh, interactions and mergers. We know that this is occurring. I mean, if you see some of these cases, where uh, the groups are very close by, the, this is actually happening over there. Uh, so this is the reasoning behind that. Uh, of course, we added to the picture uh, the morphology of the CO gas. So again, indeed, um, there is more detail the, in the Olivares paper that I mentioned. They have the, also a plot actually where they show how uh, in different evolutionary stages of the cold gas, how it actually starts uh, being cooling and then eventually ends up to a disk. It is uh, very uh, interesting. But long story short, we see also that there is a correlation with having disks and having more star formation rather than when it's not in disk, when it is just in clouds, it's probably something that it is fed into the AGM. But still, yes, this is uh, just suggestion. There is a lot of thing going on. I'm aware it's like, uh, it's, a, it's a maze, but at least we see confirmation of this from news data as well, which is uh, very encouraging. Yeah, actually, I mean, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ah, yes. Um, mm, we have checked the SSFR, yes. Uh, the ones, uh, uh, I have to go back to the plot actually, but we see that the, the star formation dominated once. Oh, sorry, yeah. this, this way. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. 
Almost, yes. Uh, one, yes, so uh, okay, yes. Um, we have we see that, yes, so I should mention that. You might know better than me that different indicators, of course, show different uh, SSFRs. But we, with FQV that we used, we see that the active star forming systems, the ones that, let's say, of the BGs that have more star formation, they present higher specific star formation rates. So the ones that are lenticulars and they have uh, cold gas are more. Yeah. But yes. But they, these all are like X ray uh, faint. And uh, yeah. So that's why also their origin. Comes from star formation. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've seen uh, all these eighteen species, which are morphologies. Um, you know, if they're mostly that came from the outskirts of the X-ray hot emissions, uh, it's mostly driven perhaps by magnetic fields, or is there any like break it like? Uh, like breaking in the X ray that would indicate there's mm. a shock process driving the Benson. Yes, are we talking about now the recent ones in the clusters or the earlier ones in the groups? Uh, the recent ones in the clusters. Okay, in the cluster, perfect. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. So these ones, yeah, we can see them uh, anywhere actually. So the ones that I showed in blue, thank you. Like this, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, for example, yes, uh, for this is in the center, uh, but some of these are actually, yes, in the periphery of, uh, it, it is in the field, actually. In the field of um, America, in the middle field, uh, we just see this kind of things, actually. So, so these, so these filaments, uh, but this one, yes, uh, we. Correct. Yes. So we are, we are not exactly sure what this is, but this has been suggested by Berkshaw et al. Uh, I think he's over here in the talk. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'm sure he will correct me. Uh, in 2014, I think uh, that, that, that this, uh, this has actually a plasma that has been driven into a frozen magnetic flux tubes. Correct. So this actually gives rise to this kind of filamentary structure. But still, this is just a... Uh, suggestion and we try to figure out what is going on but yes this is as you see exactly uh, completely unrelated with the central engine and nothing to do with them uh, yeah, really uh, uh, um, so yeah correct me if i'm wrong here this is not really my area of expertise but um, i think when you were summarizing the part one you were saying that the presence of uh, X ray will most for likelihood of finding active radio galaxies. Is that correct? Yes. In groups. Yes. In groups, yes. Um, uh, is, is it known to science or not at all when this translates over to clusters? So this is exactly uh, no. It's a good question. Actually, this is the the. Yeah, can you repeat the question? Ah, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. The question is that uh, in, the, in the summary of the first part, I mentioned that uh, X-ray the the existence of X-ray X-rays actually promotes radio AGN and uh, the existence of radio uh, galaxies. Is that the, the case in clusters as well? So the difficulty in selecting uh, group samples is that, uh, like I've mentioned earlier, the, not all of them possess an intra group X-ray intra group medium. So in a way, we tried to have those that were looking mostly like more comparable to clusters. So that's why we have a central BGE uh, trying to have a selection that can, can be a fully collapsed group so that it may have, like you see half of them had X-ray emission and all and all. So actually in X-ray clusters, all of them, uh, they're like huge, they're massive. They're all, all of them have X-ray emission, some kind of X-ray emission in any case. I mean, uh, large scale for sure for all of them. So. This is the thing now. We have the like the two um, NGC forty two sixty one and one. I think the big jets that I showed. Most of the cases, uh, okay, not all, but it looks like in clusters we have like this because we have an abundance of gas, uh, lots of gas that can actually feed the central BG, and that's why we have all these huge and fancy outbursts, and that's why people have actually focused their work on feedback in clusters for for till now because it's profound place to check that, but poor little groups, they were like left behind, but now they get the revenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was one uh, Hogan et al, if I'm not mistaken, in 2015 and all. Yes, and we, uh, they get a similar uh, detection rates for the central galaxies, yes. Oh, above 80%, if I'm not mistaken, more or 90, even, I think. So yeah, they get a lot of, yeah. Thank you. Good.